It's the beginning of a fundamental revolution, and it's, of course, the second revolution. We haven't understood the first one. The first one was the electronic revolution, which produced the hardware. The new revolution is an informational revolution, which is going to turn society upside down. Uh, every single institution is going to become affected, and, of course, the education system as a whole is going to get turned upside down from here on in. A computer in every home. That's the first stage of the information revolution. You probably use it for keeping your bank account, keeping track of your income tax, even perhaps to remind you of all the family birthdays. But a computer program like this needs very exact replies to its questions before it will give you any information. It's no good, for example, just typing in don't know. You won't get anywhere. Let's have a look. Re-enter. You see, I have to do it again. Now, this particular program reacts only to a number, so I'll key in six. The rest is computer magic, if you like. Well, that's all very nice if you're a numbers freak, but it's not much use if you're trying to teach a child, say, French or history. The computer language is just too stiff. But there are now computer languages around that give you the extra flexibility that you need to teach a language like French. They're called author languages. And this particular one I have running now is called Common Pilot. It's so flexible, in fact, that I can actually have a conversation with it. With a computer language like this, a teacher could write programs to teach pupils almost anything. Right. Um, on the blackboard, you've got some samples of use of tenses where a different tense is used in English from the tense used Sharon Wilkes is one of the pioneers. The She's developed computer programs for helping her French students. Present tense. Uh, Riley, can you tell me how you form the future tense? You take the infinitive of the verb and add the appropriate endings. Uh, I. These 13-year-olds at Birmingham's King Edward's Five Ways School are struggling their way through French grammar. But for poor Riley, the struggle has been eased with the help of the school computer. Here he can move at his own speed through the intricacies of irregular verbs and unfamiliar nouns. Birmingham is well advanced in bringing computers into the schools. This is the terminal room at King Edward's Five Ways School. There are six terminals linked by special lines to a computer at Aston University. The school has a special deal. They can use the university computer 24 hours a day, five days a week for four and a half thousand pounds a year. The terminals are there even when school is finished for the day. So boys can spend their spare time learning the ropes in computer programming. And surprise, surprise, there's no shortage of willing pupils. I think we'll put uh, your input is outside the set parameters. Yeah. The senior boys have time set aside for them to work with staff on developing new programs for computer-aided learning. Indeed, the senior boys themselves run the whole system, organising the schedules and helping the younger boys to come to terms with the world of computer education. But between 8 in the morning and 5 o'clock, these terminals have a job to do, helping out with the daily lessons in chemistry, in biology, or, of course, in French. All I can say is that an unusual event has happened in as much as that boys of 13 who'd rather be out playing football spend their time at lunchtime practicing French verbs in their own time, which is, um, to a, a te in a teacher's viewpoint, quite a, a step forward. So I th it might be the technology, and I'm, certainly, I'm certain that part of it is the technology, but I think also the fact that they can communicate with that computer and it takes a sort of personal interest in them, and only in them, and they can choose what they want to do in their own time has helped some of them, and they have in fact enjoyed it. What's the practical purpose of this? What will schoolboys leave this school with? Well, I think there are a number of phases to the development. The first thing is that all pupils will leave this school having had significant contact with computers, using them to some purpose, whether it's in the middle school to assist the, the learning of routine work, 
whether it's in the sixth form, in a more problem-solving capacity. So that's the sort of first step. As we develop our plans, which we're currently engaged upon, we hope that we will strengthen the links we already have with industry, and then we shall move into the area of using microprocessors and microelectronics, which is obviously nationally a very important area. King Edward's Five Ways swap their programmes with Oundle, a public school near Peterborough where parents pay £2,500 a year to give their sons a private education. At Oundle, they've put their money into microcomputers and they cover every part of the electronics spectrum. There's an electronic workshop where boys learn about computer hardware. They make their own printed circuit boards. They design and build microelectronic devices. Charles Major calls this a music synthesizer. In a physics class, you find boys using computers as tools to solve practical problems, like measuring the acceleration of a trolley down a ramp. The computer will work to very fine degrees of accuracy. And in the computer room, you'll find boys learning the art of programming. These particular programs were written by these 14-year-olds. Have you noticed anything different or changing about the attitudes of your pupils themselves when they're confronted with computer technology? Yes, they can't wait to get their hands on it. That's the main problem. They can't wait to get their hands on it? Yes. Well, they've got no preconceived ideas. Um, unlike teachers or normal management people, for example, they come in with no misconceptions and they just accept it like the telephone or the TV. And expect to be able to use it in every way. But why is it that pupils are aggressively enthusiastic about computers when they're not often aggressively enthusiastic about the learning process itself, about coming to school? It's part of technology. It's obviously an exciting field. There's uh, a, a satisfaction too, I think, that they can master something which is obviously fairly complicated and yet they can walk into that and darn well do things that will leave a lot of adults absolutely standing. Uh, there's obviously a satisfaction there. Too. You found that they're actually better than you are sometimes at doing these oh, things? Oh, unquestionably, yes. How long have the British schools got as a collectivity? How long have they got to really get hold of this? Well, if we're talking nationally, it's a matter of acting yesterday rather than tomorrow. We've got to get moving very fast in order to keep the technological side of this country going. There's obviously an enormous job to do, and if we're going to educate all the children in the schools at the moment, then that's a mammoth task. And we're talking about the technological future of this country. And we've got to start now or yesterday? Yesterday, preferably. Are you frightened of computers? No. That's what I like to hear. No. You're not frightened? No. What do you think they do? Work sometimes. Work sometimes? Oh, I'll work sums out, that's right. But these yes. children are the real inheritors of tomorrow's world. These eight-year-olds are meeting a computer for the very first time. And in Britain, you could class these children as a very privileged minority. Because you can count the number of primary schools that have a computer in the classroom on the fingers of one hand, and possibly on the thumb. The programme we've just been running on the computer starts off, and the first question it asks is, does the creature that you're thinking of, does it fly? And the answer is either yes or no, and there's no two ways about it. Here at Carsick Primary School in Sutton near Nottingham, the children can get to know the computer as a friend and helper. Not by courtesy of a benign and forward-looking education authority, but courtesy of Deputy Head Derek Danes. Derek bought and built this microcomputer on a bank loan. He structured his whole school around the new maths, Fletcher maths. So the children work in Boolean logic, mathematical concepts of and and or and not. They learn to count, not just in bases of ten like the rest of us. They start in binary, counting only in ones and noughts, just like the computer. So today, these children are classifying their fingerprints in binary, while these do the same sort of exercise with a mail order catalogue, or they use a nursery toy to work out for themselves in binary, a solution to the classical Towers of Hanoi problem. And all the time they're building an understanding of the way you classify and search for information, just like a modern computer. 
Now, the work you've been doing this morning is all connected with it. And the question is, what is the connection between what you've been doing this morning, the Tower of Hanoi, the product coding, binary selection cards, and all the rest? What's the connection between that and the data tree? Elizabeth. Well, um, as that branches out this, doesn't it? It's either got to be yes or no. That's right. It's the important point, isn't it? It's got to be yes or no. And there's nothing in between. There's no maybe or perhaps or I'll think about it. It's got to be yes or no. This is the age at which we should get children interested. Um, the children in this school now know more about computers than most of their parents, which is as it should be. And uh, for my colleagues, the rest of the teachers in the country, I would say that um, the time is going to arrive, and in the not too far distant future, two, three years, when the pressure is going to come from the children themselves and their parents. The child is going to arrive at school knowing more about the computer than the teacher does which is ridiculous, and it sets up a lovely situation, neatly, neatly reverses everything. That's going to happen, I'm sure. But there's no way all schools in Britain could afford to buy their own computers. But there is another possibility. The manufacturers say it won't be long before every home in the country has its own computer, and they'll do it something like this. This is baseball, American style. Oh, look at that. Oh, okay. But it's the players who play the game. By carefully moving the control sticks, they can pitch and curve the ball. Or move a fielder to catch and return it after a hit. Until recently, TV games could only play one particular sport, but not any longer. With these new systems to play a different game, you just plug in a different silicon chip cartridge. There's even a keyboard for learning games using numbers and words. In fact, one cassette turns the system into your own computer so that you can learn computer programming. With a television set and a console like this, you already have most of a powerful microcomputer system. And this system will cost about £150. But soon you won't even have to buy cassettes of games or teaching programmes. You'll be able to hire them through tele software. Yet another step in the computer revolution. Prestel, for example, is a system designed by the British Post Office. With it you can use your television set to call up millions of pages of information down an ordinary telephone line. You, the subscriber, pay for the information that you use on your telephone bill. Already, Prestel is a cost-effective office system. As the prices come down, the sales will go up, and the Prestel decoder will become a standard part of every home TV. When every home has a television set, a Prestel decoder, and a home computer like this, then every family will have a vast educational system at its fingertips. In fact, enlightened governments of the future may well have to provide a free database as part of the national educational network. In the future, most of the learning that children do that is considered the traditional learning, reading, writing, arithmetic, introduction to science, introduction to geography, uh, history, etc., these will be done in the home, in front of the television set, using the interactive computers. And what I would like to see is grandmothers receiving a certain amount of training and being assigned to no more than two or three young toddlers in the neighborhood and they work with those toddlers for the next 10, 15 years as a kind of knowledge guide, as a kind of electronic ombudsman in case uh, there the, are the problems, and also to provide the past and, 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 and the local conditions, particularly that they tell what it was like when they were a girl in that neighborhood and, and what they remember their grandmothers telling them. The television set and the computer will be the window on the world and on the future. Now, the, as I said, the traditional skills will be learned by the child at home. It will go to school to do the things you can't do at home, like play cricket or uh, do dramatics or uh, play games uh, with other children. In other words, what the future will hold is a system whereby you go, school to, you go to school to have fun and you go home to learn. 
what we will see is the creation of a generation that is so sophisticated, that is so knowledgeable, that will be able to solve problems that you and I haven't even asked. Uh, and that is going to make for a very much more humane and livable world. Because for the first time, we, create, we upgrade the intellectual capability of the human race to a level undreamed of before. That is the implication of the new information revolution.